the sustainability management master's program, you're answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. But at the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. Um, a distinguished leader in the consumer product sector with over two decades of dynamic experience. Her career highlights include leading the beauty, health, and sustainability lab at Good Housekeeping Institute, where she has supervised studies across a vast range of product categories. Birnora's experience has significantly impacted Good Housekeeping's audience, um, engaging more than 50 million readers monthly with insightful content and product reviews. She has been a vital player in the evaluation and endorsement process for the revered Good Housekeeping Seal, which, was, um, which is a hallmark of trust and excellence for uh, American consumers in a wide range of categories, from cosmetics to OTC drugs to health remedies, pet care, and even insecticides. Her educational background involve, um, in, includes a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Basaji University in Turkey, two graduate degrees from Stevens and a postgraduate certificate in sustainability analytics from Columbia University. Recently, Bernor rejoined Stevens as a part-time researcher and launched her consultancy practice. Bernor, please take it away. Thank you, Reha. This, is, this was a great surprise. I was gonna surprise you and uh, thank you as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Sarkar for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Khalid for streamlining all the process from uh, submitting uh, titles and uh, the uh, abstract, everything worked wonderfully. And also Reha, I wanted to congratulate you on your uh, President's Award. Last uh, week you received uh, uh, for your day job. Uh, and so I'm really excited to be here. I was just thinking the last time I ever had to speak to the uh, Stevens community was probably when I was defending my thesis, and that was very long time ago. So let's dive right in. Uh, and um, why? Okay. Uh, how come I not? Said, uh, okay. Okay. So here we are. So I know uh, Reka a little bit mentioned uh, about, you know, my previous uh, gig. Uh, but I wanted to go a little bit uh, closer to how I ever uh, came to uh, the world of marketing claims. Uh, and so uh, a big chunk of my career, I spent at the Good Housekeeping Institute. This is the foremost consumer product testing laboratory in the nation. It was founded uh, at the set, uh, turn of the last century, 1900. Uh, it was first an independent lab, then the publishers of the Good Housekeeping magazine, uh, founded in 1885, acquired this uh, and brought it as a testing arm for this publication. Uh, the experts at the Institute, the staff, evaluate consumer products, all sorts of consumer products other than beauty and health, etc., including vacuum cleaners, toasters, you can think of, uh, are evaluated based uh, on some uh, industry standards if they exist or in real life conditions and also uh, with subjective questionnaires by consumers. And then these um, tests power the, uh, the product reviews that now reach 50 to 60 million uh, readers every month. So uh, it's, it's a well-established magazine. So in addition to 
doing uh, reviews, product reviews. The institute staff is also responsible from evaluating the products that apply for the Good Housekeeping Seal, which is a licensing program. Uh, and there is when one has to look at very close to the marketing claims because uh, the, the seal has a consumer warranty. Uh, per, if, if a consumer purchases the product and they're not happy with the performance of the product or it breaks down, they, come, they can come directly good housekeeping uh, and ask for re repair, replacement, or their money back. So uh, that's how I got tangled up in the world of uh, uh, reviewing claims, marketing claims. Somehow I have hard time uh, advancing this. Okay, maybe I'm I'm pushing the wrong button. So. So first we're gonna do a little introduction to marketing claims, what are some of the echo claim verbiage, uh, how we define greenwashing. We're gonna take a look at some case studies and these are uh, mostly in areas that I'm more, most comfortable with. Uh, and some of you know the cases I'm mentioning have become public uh, for, very, for uh, a reason that you'll find out. Uh, and then we're also going to discuss is within the regulatory landscape of uh, of making green claims in the co co consumer uh, product realm. Uh, then we're going to discuss uh, some third party emblems that we can trust and come up with a, you know a guideline of uh, uh, making ethical claims. And then we'll open it up to uh, uh, questions. So I, you will notice this. Uh, there's some. There, there are going to be some AI generated uh, pictures or images. Uh, you know, I think it can be very addictive. To you know, I stop myself from, from using them all the time. Uh, there are also going to be images uh, taken from features that uh, on from articles that I contributed at Good Housekeeping. So it's not all AI generated. So. What is a claim anyway? So it's it's any promotional point made out made about a product or brand or service, right? It could be on products packaging, it could be on products website, or it could be on print, TV, social media, or more. More and more things are on social media, right? Even TikTok and Instagram founders are making these kind of videos about their companies, etc. Uh, that's all great. What happens is the consumer can receive perceive them as specifications and benefits, right? So they kind of believe it, or you know, they're made to, you know, they would like to believe it. Uh, it could be a comparative, uh, you know, to another product or a brand, or it could be based on a product's own merits. It could be about value, uh, yeah, value price the product brings, performance. It could be regarding safety benefits, health benefits could be about ingredients, materials. And for our purposes, we're gonna focus on green and environmental claims, but there's going to be some interaction with ingredients as well, because again, they're in that realm of green and sustainability claims today. Uh, so uh, let's, let's define what's okay uh, in terms of making these claims, right? Marketers, uh, they usually want to hype up the claims a little bit, right? They they like to uh, go for uh, superlatives. Um, and some, some verbiage is okay and some it's not okay. So the Federal Trade Commission that we're also going to uh, touch upon uh, actually makes a distinction what, what's okay and what's not okay. So there's a term defined as puffery. So this is uh, a legal way of promoting uh, through hyped up claims or oversized statements. And these are statements which cannot be objectively verified or a reasonable person would take as factual. And these are allowed, okay? But if you're doing so much uh, so much puffery in the end, uh, it can of course uh, erode your brand image. For example, if, if a cafe down the road says they have the best cup of coffee in the entire world, you would know this is puffery. I mean, it's you know impossible to prove that they have absolute base cup of coffee, and it's just kind of they're very proud about their coffee they're making. 
but what's false advertising and it could be grounds for legal action is then you start attaching some things that look like facts, right? So if you're saying it's, you know, a product is hundred percent natural and there's no basis about it, or it's preferred by 89% of consumers over XYZ product. So this, this is illegal. And, you know, if you're out it, or if somebody goes after you, it could be grounds for um, legal action. So um, let's look at what's in the lexicon of uh, green claims. Uh, I, I try to, you know, um, kind of summarize them. They could be ingredient related, non-toxic, chemical free, free off, natural. I'm not going to say which ones are my pet peeves, but you can guess me as a chemical engineer. We know everything is made out of chemicals. So again, uh, they could be end of life related reusable, recyclable, recycled, uh, biodegradable, compostable, um, or it could be more general, earth-friendly, eco, environmentally friendly, eco-conscious, you know, they're all in that realm. And more and more, we're seeing sustainable. Uh, that's that's when, you know, sustainability uh, professionals, you can get excited, you know, you're seeing this uh, now in the consumer's, uh, I guess, minds. Um, and there are more and more other more detailed aspirational claims emerging related more like to carbon emissions and uh, et cetera, or waste, zero waste, climate neutral. So they're all within that realm of claims. Uh, and greenwashing uh, is the act of making false or misleading statements about the environmental benefits of a product or practice. And there isn't always a malice involved. Sometimes it's just a simply simple disconnect between the marketing verbiage and the merit of the product or the, the reach of the impact that they're uh, proposing. So what could possibly be leading to uh, this greenwashing or contribute to, to greenwashing? So there's definitely um, this lack of or perceived lack of regulations and guidance uh, and enforcement. Um, there's also, you, you might, some of you might be already working in supply chains, uh, procurements, um, or in the field already, you know, supply chains are complex. Uh, there's lack of data and measurements. On top of that, I believe uh, now, you know, there's a lack of sustainability experts in the right places. So obviously when someone is cooking up these marketing claims, they're not asking a sustainability expert uh, or they're not in the room. So uh, because they like to push the marketing uh, claims, their limits, you know, pushing the limits of imagination. Sometimes that is so complex or the topic is, you know, it's been oversimplified to either fit on packaging or for the sake of the consumer. Uh, and we also now find that some, some of this verbiage, some of these concepts are perpetuated by media, uh, social media, I would say, uh, and influencers. So these are all factors contributing to it. So let's let's take uh, you know and look at some of these where and you know think about what could be wrong with um, some of these claims or why where why they could be problematic. So eco friendly um, sounds nice enough, but if you think about it, all products have at least some negative impact, right? So you know you know sustainability is not necessarily ever friendly. We know whether we can sustain this action going forward. Um, so natural, uh, no formal definition and most ingredients and products in consumer, uh, consumer goods are processed, non-toxic. Again, this is too broad. Uh, you know, there's a, a phrase saying the dose makes the poison. Even water could be poisonous to human beings, right? If you consume too much water, you can die off of it. I mean, it doesn't, it didn't happen that many times, but it's possible. Uh, biodegradable, uh, most waste streams, 
don't have the right conditions for this to happen very easily. Recycled, this could be misleading if you're only putting a very small amount, for example, into uh, a product, what we call a fufu dust, right? That you put a little bit of something, a recycled content and call the whole thing recycled, misleading. Again, sustainable, too broad, needs to be explained uh, as to why. Clean, uh, this is this is a word BH used with uh, attribute, used with beauty products. It has no formal definition and we're gonna talk about a case study about this. Um, Three off, uh, you know, th this is, uh, th again, we have a case study coming up about this. And all I'm saying is you better have no measurable amounts of the claim ingredient in that product because you could be in trouble. I find these claims are especially annoying <laughs> if they are used in a non-typical environment. So, for example, alcohol-free shampoo. You know, going back, how, whenever uh, shampoo was, uh, you know, innovated, uh, th there has never been alcohol in a shampoo. at alcohol, as far as I know. Or no phosphates used in conjunction with cosmetics. This was an issue with laundry detergents. And, you know, that was phased out several, you know, decades ago. Then with dishwasher um, detergents, again, phased out. But this is kind of, you see these with cosmetics these days, and that's just, um, uh, you know, I call it greenwashing. Uh, so now, you know, this is so funny. When I was getting ready for this presentation, you know, I found this dish around, uh, you know, uh, plate in my household. I didn't certainly buy this. It just, I don't know, came from school with my kids or something. And and I'm, I propose if we have time in the end, we actually... Go and you know look at the claims at the back of this plate because that could be a nice um, case study. Uh, but one thing I want to draw attention to is it says biodegradable, and <laughs> I had this plate at least five years in my household, and it hasn't biodegraded. So there's definitely a mismatch over here. Uh, so our first case study is about clean beauty. So I I define it as. It's a mega trend that has been a major source of greenwashing. Why a beauty, why clean? First of all, beauty personal care is a huge market global, right? I have some stats here. Uh, you know, US is always a, a, the biggest market for most anything and especially also for beauty, very big beauty market. The natural or clean or non-toxic beauty is a smaller portion of this uh, this big chunk pot be spent on our, you know, grooming and beautifying ourselves, cleaning ourselves, but it's a category that's growing, right? So it's their, you know, projected growth here. And so, and who, who has the oversight, you know, uh, on, on cosmetics? It's Food and Drug Administration. Uh, well, Food and Drug Administration, it's all great. But to start with, they already have a very small budget compared to other agencies. I saw their budget is small. Well, on top of cosmetics, you know, they regulate human and uh, animal foods, veterinary drugs, human drugs, medical devices, vaccine, think COVID, uh, tobacco. They have bigger fish to fry, right? Uh, so as a result, you know, they go, they do uh, audits uh, where cosmetics are made, you know, from to time to time, etc. They didn't even have the recall uh, right uh, up until now. Uh, so this whole propagation of the clean beauty was because FDA's oversight on uh, cosmetics wasn't as strong as pharmaceuticals uh, per se, and uh, the the perpetuation of this this need for cleaner uh, beauty products, which implies there's something dirty in them, uh, is because you know Canada and EU um, their governments have said right out thirteen hundred ingredients are banned for um, you know using cosmetics, 
Uh, and FDA, on the other hand, had only prohibited 11 ingredients or groups of ingredients. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the laws uh, are from 1938. It's about to change. Actually, a new law was introduced in the Biden administration. It's going to have stricter ingredient review, mandatory adverse uh, reporting and recall uh, authority, etc. But it's not going to touch uh, cosmetics and or green claims around cosmetics as much um, from what we what we know. And uh, this this uh, picture here, the visual here, it's coming from uh, when uh, I co-wrote an article on clean beauty. It's it's in our good housekeeping, uh, not our. It's on the good housekeeping website, uh, and you can you can look it up and and uh, find out what we said about this uh, particular area. Um, so yeah, you might be surprised uh, why FDA doesn't have any oversight on these kinds of green claims. We already mentioned it's um, mostly, you know, uh, make sure that safety involved, you know, safety. Uh, uh, but the, there's another federal agency called Federal Trade Commission, which is, uh, it's a bipartisan federal uh, agency, and they would like to protect the consumers uh, and um, promote competition. So they actually have oversight on advertising. They are also the ones that have come up with these when they saw these green claims becoming, um, you know, mainstream came up what what's called green guides. So there's there's oversight or uh, uh, regulation uh, on it. Uh, it was introduced in 1992, updated in 12, 2012. They're actually in the process of updating it again. So, you know, uh, and uh, on top of that, there is a self-regulatory body called National Advertising Division, NAD. Uh, they're uh, part of Better Business Bureaus. Uh, so this is an industry, uh, uh, you know, uh, a regulatory body by the industry. And they, they look at all advertisement day in and day out, I believe. You know, they have lawyers. Uh, and uh, they, they look at the truth and accuracy of TV ads, radio ads, newspapers, anything you name it. Uh, they they will uh, assess uh, any complaints. Like sometimes, you know, uh, competitors can complain about each other. They are, you know, encroaching on this or that. So they all handle all the disputes, etc. And they're they've been around for fifty years, and they are, you know. Uh, they bring a lot of insights when there is uh, not enough oversight in certain areas. So, um, so let's look at the progression of clean beauty again. We said there is no unified definition. So, how did the market react? There are nonprofit organizations, and a environmental working group has been around for much longer than Made Safe, but they came up with their own ingredient kickouts or. I would say ratings uh, and certifications and their definition of clean. Now, several retailers uh, who you know sell beauty products came up with different sections within their you know offerings and you know clean at Sephora, Target Clean, Ulta Conscious Beauty, Credo Beauty, and we hear some of them are more strict than others, and they actually proud that they're more stricter than others. But again, since there is no uh, unified definition, what is stricter mean than other? And um, and I want to now look at how this this trend has been uh, going around. By the way, this trend isn't new. It it probably started with in the seventies with the clean makeup movement. Was also influenced by the clean eating uh, uh, trends. Um, and the consumer, there was genuine interest in consumers, and there still is. Um, so there's a consumer demand, and it was also generated. It was fueled. <laughs> uh, and then these no-no lists that these retailers came up with uh, started influencing even established manufacturers. Manufacturers, the Procter & Gamble's and the Unilever's of the world who are, have been in the business of making 
uh, these beauty products have toxicology departments. They test these things. Parabens, for example, these are uh, preservatives. First, they started tried to fight it, saying these are good. They are in blueberries, etc. But then finally gave up, and they have also variants of uh, their uh, beauty products without parabens or without sulfates. You know, uh, but so then uh, over over time, you start. You know, formulators are kind of like saying it's really hard to really formulate clean uh, products. You know, they're failing stability tests. And sure enough, then there were like some uh, concealers failing, you know, growing mold, etc. So these kinds of, uh, uh, I guess, news started hitting the media. Uh, and then cosmetic chemists also started making noise, um, you know, on social media platforms, etc. And these are like influencers, but also cosmetic chemists. And the consumers, you know, the confusion, uh, uh, I guess, proliferated. Uh, also, there are lawyers. Lawyers are, uh, you know, savvy. They can find, uh, you know, I guess, white spaces. Uh, or vulnerabilities, and um, there has been uh, several lawsuits for um, Target, Sephora. I'm not sure whether they have been resolved yet. Again, these are all in the public domain. If you are interested, you can find out. I did. I just. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't want to go into the mumbo jumbo of litigation. Uh, but so uh, we don't know whether uh, it's the end of clean beauty. Uh, I don't know, but there certainly is some backlash. So another case study is uh, on free off claims, okay? Free, in this case, free of sulfates or no SLS, no SLES. So what are these ingredients? They're surfactants, emulsifiers, lettering agents. They're typically in shampoos, shower gels, some uh, hand soaps, laundry detergents. And what's the bad rep about them? Well, SLS could be harsh to skin. Although I've seen several, you know, well-formulated products, they are, you know, they won't burn your skin. Uh, uh, and SLES, what's the bad rep about that? It's like any autoxylated uh, compound, it may contain 1,4-dioxy as a contaminant. I'm not there to minimize uh, that 1,4-dioxane is a dangerous compound, okay, it's a carcinogen. And there has been some action about like how, uh, you know, manufacturers are removing it, even trace amounts, et cetera. So that's another conversation I would say. But so that's kind of like, this is kind of the background where this company, the honest company, uh, one of the co-founders is uh, this celebrity actress, uh, Jessica Alba. They came up, uh, well, they, in their hand soap and uh, I believe laundry detergent, they were making this claim, free of SLS. Um, and their ingredient list, which I believe was public at the time, because I'm sure they were, um, you know, being transparent, uh, they listed sodium cocoyl sulfate. So anyone with a little bit of chemistry degree, or I wouldn't say not anyone, but someone with a chemistry knowledge uh, got a whiff of that. So they had the product tested and sure enough, there was SLS detected. And no surprise, this was not a case of a little bit of contamination of SLS into the product. Uh, coconut oil, which sodium cocoyl sulfate is derived from, contains a mixture of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids in the C8 to C18 the length, chain lengths, okay? And lauric acid, uh, what's where the SLS come from, uh, C12 unsaturated, is contained at almost 50% of the coconut oil. So. They actually had it. They just didn't know that they had it. Um, since then, they have you know removed, relaunched, etc. But I think there are still a bunch of uh, lawsuits following them, unfortunately. Um, 
Yeah, so I see this claim, although it's been proved, it has proven to be perilous to uh, at least this company is very popular. Uh, and all I'm, I'm saying is that, you know, you better not have it in your uh, product, otherwise it can haunt you. Uh, just to recap, uh, green guys are being uh, revised. FTC has collected comments and is expected to that they will also provide some more guidance in some areas that they haven't weighed in before because these claims did not exist, like net zero. Wasn't a thing about when they revised it in 2012 or sustainable. That word wasn't in the, in the comment verbiage. Um, uh, I wanted to do as a case study, last is a case that was brought by NAD, the the uh, the voluntary or the self-regulatory body, uh, National Advertising Division. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details of, of this case. All the cases they have looked at and uh, given uh, opinions is on their website. So if you're in this area, you should go and check. This was basically um, about a claim or about, an, you know, a... I guess an initiative by the ABA, which is the American Beverage Association. It's huge. It's a trade association of all non-alcoholic beverages like the Coca-Colas and the Pepsis and the Keurigs of the world. Uh, and they, you know, they were saying they wanted to reduce use of virgin plastic, increase the recycled PET use, et cetera, uh, blah, blah, blah. So the bottom line, the NAD, NAD found some of their claims reasonable. So they said, you can keep making them. And yet some other cases, they they uh, suggested modifications. So anyone uh, and anyone, uh, everyone can come under scrutiny. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the rules are tightening and uh, there are watchdogs out there. So now I want to go briefly into some of the trusted green emblems that we see. Uh, I'm sure you recognize some of them that I'm going to mention, uh, especially if you've been in this country for a while. Uh, the USDA organic symbol, the energy star. Uh, I'm going to probably proceed uh, to uh, with them pretty fast, uh, making only a few points. Um, USDA organic. I mean, it's great, right? We all trust it. It's 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 a you know basically took about ten years to come up with this emblem. They worked with all these stakeholders. Uh, I'm sure consumers were involved, experts. Uh, but in the end, it's it's kind of a national uh, emblem, and when we see it, we believe it. And I hope it doesn't get tarnished. You know, you never know. Uh, Energy Star is the same way. Uh, when you're shopping for an appliance, uh, you are, uh, you know, you should be seeking it out because it's it's very well recognized and it means something. Again, it's it's um, basically EPA's uh, and the U.S. Department of Energy was behind uh, this rating. Now I'm going to introduce some other uh, emblems that. Uh, in the consumer space uh, means something to us uh, as experts or as consumer or should mean to us as experts uh, is uh, Okatech. Uh, this is, um, they have seven different emblems and they uh, certify products. For example, there's an organic uh, cotton uh, certification and um it's for textile and leather goods. This industry is also, I mean, uh, fashion industry, as you know, is, I don't know if it's the biggest polluter or maybe second biggest, uh, pardon me, I can't remember exactly. It's a big polluter and there's a lot of greenwashing there in terms of, you know, there's bamboo, et cetera, you know, whatever um, type of uh, claims, which is better for you, better for the environment. And, uh, you know, it has its own uh, issues, but this emblem is something that experts uh, 
uh, value and uh, our fiber experts at Good Housekeeping also valued this uh, emblem. Uh, FSC certification, uh, this you will see on, you know, cardboard, um, it's uh, on several various package goods, uh, including beauty products. Again, uh, it means something uh, to the consumer and also is meaningful, well-regarded in the sustainability, uh, among sustainability professionals. Uh, we talked about uh, personal care, beauty, uh, you know, how to not fall into the traps of greenwashing, uh, credentialing your claims, right? Uh, you know, unless your product is, you know, made totally from like fats, oils, and essential oils for fragrancing, um, you're not going to be able to use a USDA organic uh, emblem. You can't go for that certification. So you're going to have to seek other uh, certifications. And EcoCert uh, has several, there has something for organic. Uh, the criteria is openly uh, 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 advertised on their website. Uh, they also have a definition of natural or naturally derived uh, same with natural organics, uh, similar similar criteria, uh, rule to free. That's that's a very you know, at, you know, no animal testing that has been resonating a lot with consumers. So, rule to free leaping bunny um, emblem uh, has been well recognized. Uh, all these three uh, um, emblems, Eco Cert. Uh, cruelty free, organic, uh, and natural, they're all Europe, you know, they, they came over from Europe, but it's, it's global. They have a global reach. The NSF ANSI 305, uh, it's the first and only, I think, one that uh, was established within this country. I think it's been around since 2009. And this is the same organization that also comes up with uh, water filtration equipment standards, etc. Uh, you might be familiar if you know, you know, uh, being in uh, environmental engineering or civil engineering. So uh, these are the emblems that mean something to me uh, when I purchase products. Uh, these are uh, some that you could see on household products, uh, cleaners, etc. I want to point out again, uh, you know, one is a EPA safer um, choice. It's a volunteer program. You can get listed with them. And the other one is USDA certified bio-based uh, product. Then the one in the middle is UL, uh, Underwriter Laboratories. Again, they have been around a while. It's, it's an independent, I think, uh, safety laboratory. You can see it like their emblem on plugs, etc. So these are some trusted uh, emblems. Uh, they, they, for example, UL has this uh, standard on lower uh, emissions, volatile organic compounds. Uh, these, these two are slightly diff different in a sense that the others were more like attribute specific attribute based. And these two emblems are based on a life cycle uh, approach. And uh, well regarded in that sense. Uh, and I, I wanted to, you know, come come to these two that, of course, have a special uh, place in my heart. And also, I think they have a very special place in the uh, in the consumer product arena because uh, the good housekeeping seal, which is the one on the left, uh, the one has been around since nineteen oh nine has that consumer warranty, right? So if you purchase the product, you don't like the uh, performance as advertised, how it was advertised, and you, you're you not happy how, how your vacuum is sucking, sucking dirt, you come to good housekeeping or you go to good housekeeping or it breaks down again, you come back for your money. Uh, only in, in for the 100 year uh, anniversary of the good housekeeping seal, uh, I was, fortunate enough to be in that group, we introduced a green overlay on top of that uh, seal, meaning if, if a product 
prove to be meeting uh, the performance standards of good housekeeping, then they could apply for the Green Good Housekeeping Seal, which is, again, a life cycle approach, holistic emblem. Uh, there, uh, the, the company applying for the seal would uh, disclose various uh, uh, documentation about energy reductions, water reductions, waste reductions, what ingredients they have, if they have tested on animals, that's automatic kickoff, etc. So it kind of looks at the whole uh, cycle as life cycle as much as possible, even looks at the corporate sustainability. And only if a product has earned the actual seal, meaning it actually works, right? Then they can go for this um, emblem. So that is, uh, that's the unique position of the Green Good Housekeeping seal. Um, now, B Corp, you, it's been gaining traction. It's been around, I believe, uh, for 20 years or so, or thereof, maybe 16 years. It's basically an emblem at the corporate level. Uh, the reason I wanted to mention this is it's, it's been highly regarded, although there has been some uh, chatter about them, especially now that they started uh, certifying companies outside the US and Canada when they started from. I think they have, they are seeing some challenges there. So they're also looking at their methods, uh, but overall sustainability uh, uh, professionals value this. It means something. And they pride themselves about uh, on how they have balanced purpose with profit and that they utilize the existence of their business as a force for good. So they're there basically not just, you know, maintaining, but they using that power to do more good. And they, I've been to their conferences a couple of times. They actually have a little bit of an activist vibe uh, and they have local chapters. So there's actually a New York chapter. I haven't been able to go to one of their meetings, but it seems like their meetings are open uh, for aspiring uh, B Corp companies or enthusiasts, you might want to get involved. So how about some uh, strategies going forward? Of course, you know, sustainability equivalent to transparency. Uh, need to balance the creativity with science and facts. Uh, qualify your general claims. Avoid terms like environmentally friendly, earth friendly, et cetera, unless you qualify. Why, for example, you could say we use such and such recycled content, that's why. Um, avoid these attribute related claims that have no universal definition. We talked about clean. clean. Uh, reef safe is, for example, another one that I actually wrote about. Uh, these are all danger zones because every it's open to interpretation. And that's, you're opening yourself to um, also possibly clean, you know, class action lawsuits. Um, also, you only use trusted uh, part, third party emblems. I mean, there are all these seals, we call selfie seals. You can see them sometimes on packaging, sometimes on company websites. I actually was looking for some to show here. Uh, and, you know, you can go online and they're just like all these eye stock you know, you can basically purchase these emblems and put it to put on your uh, packaging, for example. And unfortunately, I think the cruelty-free emblem is the one that's kind of uh, gets, um, I guess, copied <laughs> a lot. So be be aware, uh, you know, aware of these uh, copycats. Um, I want to kind of start wrapping up, and I hope I'm not uh, overdoing it. Uh, the landscape is changing. We already talked that there was some oversight. Uh, California, for example, introduced this new recycling labeling act. Um, it got into it went into effect in January first of this year. Basically, you, we all know about these chasing um, arrow symbols, right? So it's they would like to uh, limit the use because they think that manufacturers overuse this emblem and. Um, and uh, only, and from what we know, poly, poly PET, the most recycled uh, plastic, uh, the recycling, actual recycling rate is about 25%, right? So 
most of the plastic, although theoretically recyclable, does not get recycled. And I wanted to also say that we have just recently come up with how beauty packaging and the issues around beauty uh, packaging recycling at Good Housekeeping. It was something I was working on before I left. If you would like to check that out. Uh, European Union is, is tightening their regulations. They had the directive that went into effect, I believe, end of last year. And they are coming down hard. They We discussed already how these vague claims, environmentally friendly, natural, etc. They're talking about that. They There's one other um, class of claims, which we didn't get a, a chance to discuss, but like offsetting, right? Credits. They're, they're going to limit those uh, or they're going to have regulations on how you can make those claims. But they even went into uh, other details that caught my attention, right? You know, you can't like present goods as repairable if they're not, et cetera. So it's, it's tightening and there's more detail. And one last thing I will say is Unilever. I mean, if you've heard about it, there's case studies about it. It's poster child of corporate sustainability recently came under scrutiny in the UK by uh, Competition and Markets Authority, CMA. I believe it's it's their kind of uh, equivalent of uh, FTC. And they're investigating Unilever for potentially overstating the environmental benefits of, of its products. Again, they, they said they're using vague and broad statements. They exaggerated the claims about natural ingredients. Sometimes they're hyping up one single aspect and making it sound more um environmentally friendly than it is again about recyclability they even went as far as saying the color and imagery such as green leaves etc this implies that the products are more green than they actually are so in conclusion i hope i was able to um uh do okay with time i would like to say consumers are becoming savvy right uh, we've seen class action lawsuits are on the rise. I don't think they're going to disappear anytime soon. Uh, so the oversight is tightening. The good news, sustainability professionals like yourself, we're multiplying, right? So, and my message to you all is together, let's squash greenwashing. So with that, I will close and we can do the Q&A session. <laughs> if you like. Absolutely. 